um, welcome to Van Loon's Nursery. Thank you for coming along today to our workshop on um, uh, our 101 guide to indoor plants. My name is Heidi and I'm the owner of Van Loon's Nursery and I'm very pleased to give this presentation today because indoor plants are a bit of a passion of mine. Hands up who's got less than 30 indoor plants in their house at the moment. What? <laughs> right, my mission today is to convert you. My, um, my niece is 25 years old, the classic millennial. She has 48 indoor plants in her room. She lives in a share house. Her goal is to make it to 100. Oh, she's probably there already. They all have names. She you know, talks to them at night, puts them to bed. And uh, it, it's something that has really grabbed the attention of people young and old. So it, it's wonderful to see such a, a, a lovely interest in indoor plants. But we get, because we've got so many new gardeners, and some of us, obviously, that don't have very many indoor plants, sometimes are a little bit lost as to what to do with them. When do I water them? How do I look after it? Does it need repotting or not? We all lose confidence and get a little bit nervous sometimes when we're out of our comfort zone. So I thought today the purpose is just to make it really simple, just strip it back to the basics of indoor plants so that we've got a good basis of where to go from there. And two, you'll be able to help all the millennials in your family and get them started off on their indoor plant journey. So I guess the first question really is, what is an indoor plant? You know, at the basic level, it's something that we grow indoors, but you know, in different places of the world, indoor plants are different things. It just simply is something that you can't grow outside. We then choose to grow it indoors. So I have a family member that lives in Manchester in the UK, freezing cold over there so he grows uh, succulents indoors as an indoor plant we were on holiday in in europe many years ago uh, in the winter time so snowy cold frosty freezing uh, and along the streets you could buy um, acacias wattles proteas uh, ericas those kind of plants that we just grow in the garden without a care in the world in those climates they're sold as indoor plants but because we have such a beautiful climate here in Australia, we can grow almost anything we like. Our indoor plants are from climates that we can't grow them outside. So they tend to be tropical plants because we can't grow these things in our cold winters. So that's usually what we think of as an indoor plant is a tropical plant. So I guess any indoor plant is something that's out of its comfort zone. So there's the, the tropical uh, indoor plant zone but also we can grow plants from dry hardy climate zones as indoor plants too so things like aloes ponytail palms uh, zygo cactus and uh, this is an aloe vera we can grow those outside without any trouble at all here but they also will grow quite happily indoors so we're quite lucky in that we can straddle that indoor outdoor uh, indoor outdoor zone um, and we can do that with our indoor living spaces but and also just blouse it out into our outdoor living areas which is lovely as well to get that flow from inside to outside so indoor plants are fairly fluid anything you grow inside basically is an indoor plant the other question we sometimes get asked is or, or that we think about I guess is why do we grow indoor plants what's this fascination that we're having with indoor plants at the moment seems to have come out of nowhere uh, and it's not just it's not just a Wellington thing. It's not just a Geelong thing. It's a it's a global phenomena. People are loving indoor plants the world over, and I think partly or, or largely it's due to social media. One person puts up a picture of their gorgeous palm on Instagram, and boom, it's you know it's all over the world. But I was reading an article in the paper uh, last weekend about our need for the colour green at the moment. And I look around and I can see quite a few people wearing green and blue. So they're two colours that are very popular at the moment, as are indoor plants. And there's some uh, thought that it, it is a reaction to our, uh, our climate and our changing climate and our concerns for our changing climate, that we want to embrace nature, that we want to bring indoors, inside, and, and have greenery around us as our world becomes more challenging climatically. So that was an interesting phenomenon that we, we respond to things happening around us in all kinds of ways. Uh, indoor plants make us feel good. That's a simple, simple fact that's backed up by lots of studies and statistics. 
indoor plants release oxygen into the into our living environments they look beautiful so they make us feel good they release happy endorphins in our brains uh, if we're surrounded by greenery there are statistics to set to prove that um, leafy suburbs have less crime and children play more happily and more creatively in green spaces so you bring all that into your living area and it makes for a happy a happy and welcoming environment so I think that's a few reasons really why we're embracing greenery into our into our lives oh this wind I didn't order a windy day I think we're just gonna have to try and catch them if they go flying <laughs> Now another reason that we grow indoor plants inside is for health reasons uh, and adding oxygen of course is a bit of a basic 101. We, we all know about photosynthesis. Uh, plants breathe in carbon, I'm sorry I'm catching, they're catching my eye, I'm sure they're not going to blow away. Plants breathe in carbon dioxide and exhale oxygen, the opposite to us. That's why we have such a great relationship with gardens and plants. So plants do that, that's their, their way of breathing. But uh, at night time they actually reverse that and they breathe in carbon, they breathe in oxygen and release carbon dioxide. So they're like us at night time. They, they flip it over in, in the dark. But there are some plants that continue to breathe out oxygen 24 hours a day. And these are the plants that are known as, as great indoor plants because they are continually putting oxygen back into our environment. Now some of those that are really easy to grow, I've got a little bit of a selection here, is um, aloe vera. Aloe vera, everybody should have a lemon tree and an aloe vera plant in their garden. Got that? Good. Gold star to you, sir. <laughs> There's so, and I didn't know until I was reading up this morning, uh, just giving a little bit of extra information for my session today, that these guys are such great oxygenators. Who would have thought it? Because of course we all know about their healing qualities. Brilliant if you burn yourself on the barbecue or get a, if you um, you know, if you've got a little toddler that gets those big welts of mosquito bites, you know, a little bit of a dab of aloe vera can be really soothing to your skin. But these little babies actually exhale oxygen at night time as well as during the day. So a really good one to have indoors and very, very tough and hardy along with the zygo cactus and the mother-in-law. Now, I'm not sure if you're allowed to call them mother-in-law's tongues. It's probably not very PC anymore. The Sansevieria or snake plant, they're called. I'm showing my age. We're brought up with them called um, the, the, other, the other name. So these three plants, all very dry hardy um, and also will all breathe out oxygen at night time. So perfect for having in the bedroom. So um, on your bedside table, one of these, or if, especially if you um, are a bad waterer, because you know, it can be a challenge, we've all got busy lives and it can be difficult to remember your indoor plants sometimes. I have one of these in our um, spare bathroom that we, we use twice a year when the family come for Christmas and the occasional birthday and I water it, whether it needs it or not, twice a year. So that's how tough they are. They're really, really, very, very, very forgiving. So pretty, pretty unbeatable package for the beginner indoor plant gardener. <laughs> great um, great um, oxygen producing qualities and also incredibly uh, dry tolerant. So these used to be called Gazigo cactus. They have a new fancy name now, but these ones are just, you can see those little red bumps on the ends there. They're the flower buds that will be opening shortly. They usually flower in autumn, but this one is just being a bit cheeky and flowering in spring as well. These are lovely indoors or outdoors. So this is one that you can you can just blouse out into your pergola area, or if you've got a, um, a nice barbecue area maybe outside the kitchen. Uh, lovely in a hanging basket because they develop a bit of a weeping habit. And also you can grow them from cutting, which is a really nice thing to do um, maybe for a Christmas present or for birthdays is to grow somebody um, that you love a new plant. So zygo so cactus are another really good one. So those three I think are really great for adding oxygen. Now if you don't particularly like that kind of hard, because let's face it, plants that are low water users are usually a bit harder looking, they have that harder foliage um, because it's like an armour really that keeps all the moisture in. So if you'd like something a bit softer, this is um, a golden cane palm and this one also will breathe out oxygen through the day, through the night. So this would be a nice one again to have in your bedroom. I mean obviously any room in the house would be good, but um, I think we all love the idea of it's a bit like 
like having a window open at, at, in your room without having the without having the, the cold night air coming in. So that's a golden cane palm. These um, grow beautifully up north. If you've ever been up to Port Douglas or Bali, you would have seen them growing out in people's gardens. Indoors down here, definitely inside only, not one to put outside at all. They will freeze in our cold winters like any good Queenslander would uh, and keep them moist. They don't like to be on, on the dry side, those ones. So that, that's a, a good one for oxygenating. Now, the other question, oh, any question about oxygenating plants before we move on? No? Yeah, go, please. How big the golden cane grows? That's a good question, really, about indoor plants in general. How big do they get? And I was going to get to that one later, but we'll, we'll jump on it now. In Queensland, they grow up to four to six metres, but you'll never get anything that size out of it as an indoor plant down here. Indoor plants largely are out of their comfort zone. They're growing in a totally foreign environment to what they would normally like to be in. So the growth rate just slows right down. So they just really only put on small amounts of growth to the to where they would normally what they would normally do in their normal environment so over, I'll skip to the, to the answer now instead of palavering on. <laughs> in about 12 months time you would expect it to go from this size. With good growth you might get it up to that kind of size in 12 months time. So maybe it would do an extra half, half on top of that again. So that's growing it somewhere that's nice and bright without direct uh, sunlight coming through the window because that can be burning and keeping it moist and fed through the growing season. So we'll talk a little bit about watering and feeding in a moment but that will give you a little bit of an idea with that one. These other ones, snake plants, are quite slow to grow, so you won't see much change in those, really. A, a few new leaves a year, that's about what the most you can expect from those. But these two will multiply and grow quite happily. Aloe vera will put out little babies on the side, which you can also divide up and grow as pot plants for friends and relatives. And this one will grow quite nicely as well, uh, getting thicker and bushier, until you, have, you can fill up a hanging basket with that one quite nicely. So they'll grow a, a bit faster. So we've talked a little bit about oxygenating plants and, and we've got another question. Thank you. Also how much light they need. Oh, we will talk about light for sure. Yes, I'll get to that one. Actually, next I was going to talk about what to grow in what rooms. That's another question I think is probably one of our most frequently asked questions. What plant can I grow in a bathroom? What plant can I grow in my living room? It's a bit on the dark side. So this is something I think that people, um, we can struggle with a little bit, but it's, it's not too it's not too hard if you use a little bit of detective work. So we'll start with what can I grow in my bathroom? So if you think about a bathroom environment, obviously it's, um, it's steamy, it's often um, warm and humid, especially if you've got you know, a family of six kids and they all take 15 minutes in the shower, that can create a, a beautiful uh, humid environment. They're usually nice and bright and light, um, so ferns are good for that. Because if you use your detective hat, uh, what plants like to grow in damp conditions? Think about the Otways, if it's not raining, the water's dripping off the trees, that's all about ferns. Ferns love to be wet, you'll never overwater a fern. They're not a desert plant, they don't like to dry out. So you think about where they come from, where they grow naturally, and that gives you a little bit of a clue as to where they might be good in the house. So um, ferns, great in a bathroom because they love that humid environment. When you're in the bathroom, it's all about water. So that's a good opportunity to think to yourself, oh, better just water my fern today because here I am having a shower and my fern will also want to have a shower. So ferns are great, great plants for bedrooms, uh, for bathrooms. They're probably not a great plant for the spare bedroom that you only go in to fluff up the pillows when Auntie Doris comes to stay because you might only go in there, you know, once a month, once every six months, depending on, on how often Auntie Doris comes. So you're likely to forget to water it if it's somewhere that you're not going to see all the time. So anything that is a high water user like a fern, make sure it's somewhere that you're going to remember to water it. They don't have to be in a bathroom, but they bathrooms are good for them. So that's a good thing to remember with ferns. Now with plants that don't need as much water, like for instance a monstera, now put your detective hat on again. Monsteras, like snake plants, like aloe veras, 
like this little guy, Zanzibar Gem, have got quite leathery leaves. They're quite, they're like they're tough. This is quite soft. Uh, this is quite soft. So that gives you a bit of a clue. Tough leaves, tough plant. So it's, look, it's not a, a, a golden rule. There's always a plant that will break the rules, but you, it just helps you to kind of work out where it might fit in in the watering, uh, watering scheme of things. And this one certainly is a low water user. So anything with a bit of a leathery leaf, that gives you a clue that it's going to be a low water user. So perfect plant for the spare bedroom. Maybe if you're not a great waterer, that would be a good one to start with because they're quite forgiving if they dry out in between waterings. Other good plants um, that are good for dry, uh, if you're a dry waterer or want to use them somewhere where you're not going to think, plants that come from arid parts of the world. So this is an agave. They're from South American desert areas. This is a ponytail palm. They have a big um, cordex here. This like it's like a bulb growth that stores lots of water. So we know that these ones are come from dry climates. So they're not going to need so much water inside. So it's not too hard to work out with a little bit of detective growth, uh, detective work. This is a string of pearls. Again, they're quite fleshy, a bit succulenty. So again, that gives you that clue. They hold a lot of water in themselves so they can survive some dry periods. Now, plants that need lots of water are usually soft and they're often quite lush looking. They look a bit tropical, like our golden cane palm here or the, uh, the spathophyllum at the front here, the peace lily or kentia palm. Anything that has that more tropical look, good chance they're going to come from the tropics. And of course, we know tropical environments, it's all about lots of rain, lots of humidity, lots of warmth. So that's what gets those guys going. So they're going to be higher water users. So you can often work it out a little bit yourself if you've lost the plant label or you're not sure what to do. There's some really good guides to that. Now, watering inside, of course, is, is quite different to um, being in a jungle or, or living in the South American desert. We, we are the masters of the watering for our plants and we need to know when to do it and how often to do it. It's all very well to say, don't let me dry out, but in real terms, how often is that? I have quite a lot of indoor plants in my indoor living area and I'm, I think I might, like most people, I've got open plan living area with kitchen dining living, um, nice big room. Um, I'm a cold frog so our heating is cranked up to number 11 all winter because I don't like to be cold so it's quite warm in there. So my indoor plants, they'll, they'll dry out, uh, so they dry out maybe a little bit more quickly than you realise, certainly more so than uh, your uh, plants outside. But the trick with that is it's not their, it's not their um, growth period. Most, or let's go, we'll talk about most indoor plants because they come from tropical environments, follow that tropical cycle of seasons. So we have four seasons here and our growth seasons for our gardens are spring and summer and a little bit of autumn before it gets too cold. In the tropics they have two seasons, they have wet season and dry season. Wet season is hot and wet, dry season is a little bit less hot and dry. So plants in tropical environments don't grow very much in the dry season because there's no moisture there and it's a little bit cooler so they go into their version of winter, their dormant period. In the summer months when it's, in the, sorry, in the wet season months in the tropics when there's lots of moisture around, lots of water, the temperatures go up, the humidity goes through the roof, that's when you get lots of growth out of your, out of tropical plants. So we need to translate that back into our lounge room here in Ocean Grove. How does that work? So even though in the winter we might have our heating turned up to tropical temperature number 25, um, and it, we are having lower light levels, it's, it's a little bit darker, um, and it is the off season for plants. And plants are not stupid, they will work out that it is their off season and the growth rate will slow down. But at the same time, we don't want them to get bone dry. Need to keep them moist, but not bone dry. In the summer months, when it starts to warm up, we have more daylight hours, our tropical plants will wake up like our plants do out in the garden and say, okay, here we go, wet season's coming, I'm gonna start to grow. So that's the time that we need to increase our watering and increase our feeding for our indoor plants. So that's another one of those general rules that you add into the mix of working out when to water, when to feed. 
So during the winter months, not really much need to, to fertilise your indoor plants because they're in that, that dormant period. They're just sitting there really, enjoying the central heating but not really growing too much. You would, I water, for instance, my indoor plants about once a fortnight. Uh, I've got some in quite large pots. I water them about once a fortnight uh, to keep them happy. Smaller pots in this kind of size, I water maybe once a week if I think of it, but it, they will stretch out to once a fortnight as well. Now when I say I water them, I give them a water, a proper water. None of this little half a cup fairy waters. That doesn't do anybody any good and no favours at all. I try and pick a day where it's not too freezing, not too windy, not too wet and uh, cart my plants out onto the deck, get the hose out and give them a really water all the way through so that it saturates the whole growing environment of the pot and I water them with the hose, I go around them all, let it drain through because um, you know the, the potting shrinks sometimes doesn't it and the water will just spill out and go over the edge and not really soak into the middle so if you give it a water and you just see it all run out the bottom of the pot straight away aha you know it's not soaking in it's just going out the bottom out the sides and down the edge so you need to be a little bit patient and give them all a little bit of a top up and let that potty mix absorb the moisture now, if you've been away on holidays for a month and your plants are really quite dry when you come home and you think to yourself, gosh, I've got to give these girls all good water, and they're just not absorbing the water, you might need to use something like saturate or rapid soak. I'm sure we've all used that in the garden. And that just helps your potting mix of reabsorb the moisture so that you can make sure that root ball is wet. So by making sure that that root ball is completely soaked when you do water it, your plants will then survive quite happily for another week or two until the next water. During the winter months, it doesn't hurt them at all. In fact, they prefer to be a little bit dry between waterings. Now, that doesn't apply, of course, to ferns, because remember, these guys love water. So we're not talking about ferns here, we're talking about leafy, leafy greens. During the winter they don't mind that little bit of a dry spell because it's dry season isn't it in the tropics and they're quite used to having that little bit of a dry spell. They don't panic if they are quite dry between waterings, they will be fine. They will, as a general rule, be quite happy. From about now though, you can really start to increase your watering and increase your feeding. Uh, and I did this to my indoor plants last weekend. It was Christmas for indoor plants at my house last weekend. So I took them all outside onto the deck, gave them all a good water, so making sure that they were thoroughly moistened. And then I started my, my feeding program for my indoor plants. Now, I own a nursery and I'm not always the most attentive gardener. It's a bit like plumbers who've got dripping taps and electricians who've got dodgy light switches. Sometimes you have to do what I say, not what I do, but I do try and feed my indoor plants regularly through the summer, spring, summer and early autumn months because that's really when they're gonna get growth out of them. So I like to use Power Feed. Uh, this is put out by the company that makes sea salt. And this is the companion to sea salt because we all know that sea salt is not actually a, a balanced fertilizer. It's a beautiful tonic for your plants, but it doesn't have all the nutrients that they need. So something like Power Feed does have everything that they need. Um, so this one you mix up with water and water on. But you can also use good old Osmocote. It's been around for 100 years. That's a slow release one uh, that will last for about three months. So applying it now, we'll see them up till about January or so. You can give them another application then to see them through the autumn. So Osmocote's a nice easy way to do it. You can also, it's a few fancy ones on the market these days. Um, Munash do this little combination. Munash do um, rock dust or it's like trace elements. So it's, uh, it's like uh, the, the pure nutrients that you find in minerals. Minerals is what I'm trying to say. So you can apply that as a foliage spray or as a little powder that you just uh, sprinkle on the, on the surface of the of your pot plant works really well with something like the power feed I'm still a big fan of this one but this is a nice like a little bit of a spritzer like a little bit of a barocca that you might give them on their foliage or on top of the pot but by feeding your indoor plants with something like power feed and look you could use thrive aquasol maxi crop whatever you've got in your cupboard they're not really super fussy um, you will get lovely growth out of your indoor plants they'll um, 
plump up, the foliage will become glossier, darker green, uh, you'll put on new growth. They become healthier because the cell structure improves, so they become more resilient to insect attack, uh, any fungal problems diminish. So it's a bit like us, when we're fed and watered, we're much happier and healthier. The same for your indoor plants as well. Because don't forget, they're just surviving in that one little pot of, um, of soil, and that ran out of nutrients donkeys ages ago, so they do need to be topped up and fed like any plant in your garden. Once, once a fortnight at half strength, but about once a month is probably a, a realistic goal to achieve. So once a month with a liquid feed would be fantastic. Osmocote is just a slow release one, so that has a nice steady, uh, a steady um, regulated release of nutrients over a three month period. But there's no reason why you can't give them an extra shot every now and again with something like this. They will just love it, so you, you wouldn't run into any trouble by doing a double feed. Worm farm, worms, worm juice is great. That's a little bit like an organic fertiliser like this one. Just keeping in mind that worm juice is, is as good as the compost that your worms are eating. So if you have nice, healthy, happy worms, you'll get great fertiliser. So, but it wouldn't hurt to maybe alternate with something that's, that you know is really balanced. Every now and again, throw that in the mix. Have we got any questions, any other questions on watering and feeding? I'm bound to have forgotten something, thank you. Pal feed and sea salt, they're like complementary products. So sea salt will stimulate root growth and this one delivers nutrients to the roots. So they kind of work really well hand in hand. So this one you would use more, but if, for instance, your indoor plants are looking a bit, about this time of year, they're looking a bit tired, they're looking a bit tatty, they just need like a real bit of love, then you might give them a couple of applications of sea salt as well as this at the same time. And that's just that extra boost of nutrients and stimulation. Any other questions on feeding and watering? Thank you. Let them soak. That soaking your indoor plants is a great idea, especially if you've got small size pots. So um, this lady was asking, can you soak your indoor plants in water or with some fertilizer? And the answer is absolutely, yes you can. I remember my mother filling up the bath and putting all the indoor plants in there. So they would sit quite happily in water, um, certainly overnight, no problems at all. It just really, it's a good way of really re-wetting re that root ball if they become very dry. So that's a, a really good method. And you might do that every now and again, maybe you know once every couple of months through that, that summer period just to make sure that they're, they're really absorbing all that moisture up into their foliage. And actually just while I think of it, putting your plants in the bath is a great little trick if you're going away for a week and you haven't got anyone to come around and water your indoor plants. Fill up the bath with you know six inches of water, pop all your indoor plants in there, give them a holiday and pop a little bit of something or rather delicious in there for them and when you come home they'll all be nicely hydrated uh, and, and off they go again. So that's a nice little trick. Any other questions on watering? Yeah, that can that can affect your indoor plants. So a question about indoor heating and how that can affect our indoor plants. While indoor plants like the warmth of, of our central heating in winter, they don't like the dry air um, because uh, they love the warmth, but it usually is coupled with humidity where they come from in the tropics. So that dry air coming from a ducted heating system coming down from the ceiling or up from the ground can really dehydrate your your leaves on your indoor plants and that's why you get that browning on the on the leaves it's just simply that they're dehydrating and, and not loving it um, so this one has got a little bit you see a little bit of that on on most indoor plants and look even without um, indoor heating you will still get that just because simply because we're in Victoria we're not in Queensland we're not in Bali or Thailand our air is drier here so that is a little bit of a challenge and one that unfortunately we do just live with is a bit of that drying on the leaves. 
you can get around that and look if you're a, a true indoor plant aficionado and have got lots of time to lavish attention on your indoor plants atomizing them with a, a spray bottle of water um, keeping a large size saucer under your pot with pebbles or sand filled with water so that you've got that constant little bit of evaporation coming up around your plant will help to relieve or, or help to increase humidity around your plants um, but the reality of it is we're all going to get some browning leaves at some stage in our indoor plant career it doesn't mean that your indoor plant is unhappy or that it's going to die uh, it just it's a little bit like me my skin gets really dry and crackly in the winter as well uh, and you just with a pair of scissors just give them a snip and just tidy them up and just sort of simply snip off those brown edges and that will keep them looking looking good but just do remember to keep them don't let them get too dry so good question but uh, you would if you could avoid having them too close to your indoor heating so keep them away from vents where so they're not getting that direct hot air really blowing on them if you see your plants you know flapping in the in the ducted heating breeze they're not going to be at all happy yeah any other questions thank you you can overwater plants. Um, indoor plants, uh, tropical indoor plants, less so. They're usually more forgiving for overwatering. But anything that comes from a dry type climate will certainly won't like to be overwatered. Now, the other thing that is always on the label is keep moist, not over wet. And that can be a hard one to know. What is keep moist and what is over wet? Basically, if you stick your finger in it a little bit, and that, by the way, is the best moisture media you can ever get, stick your finger in a little bit, and if it's damp and an inch down, you don't need to water it because it will be moist enough. You can get to feel a little bit the weight of the pot. If it feels light, you pick it up and you go, whoa, that's really light. That means that it's a little bit dry and it's probably going to need watering. If it feels nice and weighty, then there's a good chance that it's got plenty of water. So again, it's that little bit of detective work. As a general rule, keep them moist. They won't want to be swimming in water or not sitting in a source of water constantly, um, but just letting them not be dry, especially during the summer months is, is important. Now, any other questions on watering or feeding? No? Very good. Ask about temperature so much, right? Oh, yes, sorry. Our house is quite cold. Mm -hmm. And that an onion I live in this time of year, yeah? So, I have a plant like that died. Yeah. Is that too, like, it's too cold? So, it, yes. It, it's in a light area where it's, where it's bright. Sure. Sometimes cold can be our enemy as well. Like they can just be too cold, especially if you bought them from um, maybe a, a retail outlet that's just had them come down from um, Brisbane, where they've been in a nice igloo up there, and they come down to Victoria and it's nine degrees outside. That can be a little bit of a shock to the system for them. Some plants don't like it too cold, and and they can they can suffer. At Van Loons, we always try and keep plants that are that we know to be hardy and that will survive in our winters. So usually, anything you get from us should be okay. But if you do notice it, um, it'll drop foliage. It will it will look unhappy. Just pop it into a warmer room over the winter, and then back up to the other room in the when the weather warms up a little bit. Now, indoor plants, as a rule, like to be in a bright position. I'll just quickly touch on this. On the labels, they'll always say, grow in a well-lit position. What is a well-lit position? Because sometimes we want to put them uh, in the corner behind the TV because that's a bit of a flat spot and you really look nice having a plant over there. But unfortunately, that's not always the best place for them. They like to hug the window. They like to be around your windows where it's nice and bright. But they don't, as a rule, don't like direct sun coming through the window because that can burn or bleach the leaves. So it doesn't always mean that they'll burn, but they can just lose, uh, lose colour, go yellowish and, and look, uh, get spotty, be unhappy if they're getting too much light. Most indoor plants are from the tropics that we're looking at, so um, things like the peace lily, the philodendron at the bottom here, uh, even the palms, the monstera, they're, um, they're under canopy trees. They're the plants that grow on the forest floor, so they're used to getting that dappled light as it comes through the big tropical trees. So they don't need full sun, they just need nice light. So somewhere close to a window, usually within two to three metres of a window is okay. Uh, not too far off to the side because that becomes quite dim um, to quite quickly, but somewhere around that circle of the window. So that's what we would call well lit. 
if you've got um, a bit of a lace curtain or a bit of a shutter that you can just redirect the sun, that's a great way too of just taking the edge off the sun but still having them in a the nice well lit position. Now some plants will take more, will take a, a lower lip position than others and they're really useful to use in, in, our, in our houses um, because, home, especially if you live in an older, my um, house is Victorian, so small windows, pokey rooms and not really designed for indoor plants. So things like peace lilies and kentia palms, this one um, will take a low lip position. So they're really good for darker rooms, somewhere where it's, uh, it's lower light, where they're not going to flower. Uh, or not going to grow, uh, what am I trying to say? Not very well lit, where it's a bit darker. So they're Kentia palms and Spathophyllum lilies, excellent for that. If you want something to flower though, uh, like our moss orchid here, this one definitely needs to be getting more light, so that would need to be in that circle of the window area for that one to flower. The same with our zygo cactus. And also true of anything that's got a little bit of colour in the foliage. So um, this uh, Zanzibar gem is a bit bronzy. Sometimes we'll have um, quarter lines that are nice pinkish red. Anything with a bit of the colour in the leaf will need to have a little bit more light to bring out the, the colour in that foliage. So that's uh, something to remember with those ones. Any questions on position? Well lit, what's well lit, what's not? Very good. Now quickly we might, because I won't want to talk on too long, I might talk a little bit about styling. Oh, firstly we'll talk about um, keeping them pest and diseases. Gosh, I nearly forgot about pest and diseases. So what do we do when things go wrong? Because that does happen. And you might wonder, how on earth does my indoor plant get that bug? Or why has it got this? Why, how did that happen? It's been sitting on my kitchen bench. But we bring them in on our clothes. Um, we, you know, your washing's out on the line. Birds land on the washing line. They come in all kinds of ways into the home. Um, so there are a couple of easy ways that you can treat any bugs that you might get on your indoor plants. Now by bugs I mean aphids are the most pop, um, one of the most common ones and scale is the other one that's really common. Now the giveaway indicator with those is that the foliage will become sticky and you might see some ants climbing on your foliage or you might, um, maybe you've got it on this coffee table and you don't notice that the foliage is sticky but you keep having to wipe that stuff on, on the coffee table and why is it sticky there and who spilled cordial on the coffee table again? It might be that it's you've got aphids or scale on your indoor plants and it's that honeydew that they secrete that's dripping onto your table so that's a real indicator that you have an insect problem. Of course you may see them on the foliage because they are sitting there in plain sight but sometimes that's the best disguise and we don't notice them. So for those two insect problem problems, spraying with an oil based spray like eco oil, uh, white oil would do the same job, you're actually smothering that insect problem. So that's um, a very effective way of particularly getting rid of scale insect. Scale insect often will hide on the underside of the leaves and it looks like a little white cluster of bumps or it could be brownish colour, it could be blackish colour and if you flick them with your fingernail they'll be a bit squishy underneath. That means then that you've got scale. Aphids, you can see they are little bugs that will be, they usually cluster together. Um, but eco oil will get rid of those two insect pests for you quite happily. The only thing you can't use an oil spray on is ferns. Uh, because it can be a little bit burning on ferns because they've got quite soft foliage. So just not on ferns, but on any of your other indoor plants, an oil-based spray, it's a really good preventative spray. It also makes the leaves look nice and shiny, which is quite nice to dress them up. And it's a nice thing to do a couple of times a year is to, uh, especially with your leathery leaf plants, take them out onto the deck on a nice day with just a soft cloth and, a, and some um, water and just wash them, just simply wash the leaves because they'll get dusty and linty, especially if you've got them in the bedroom. Every time you flick the doona up over the bed, off goes another layer of dust mites and who knows what else. <laughs> so your plants will get dusty like anything else. So giving them a wipe down keeps the, the leaves functioning properly. Um, wipe them down with a damp cloth and then give them a spray with something like an oil-based spray 
spray or you could use um, a leaf shine product and that will just bring up that lovely gloss on your indoor plants again and gosh they look great. I have a big um, fiddly fig in our lounge room. Every now and again I give it the, the dust treatment and I think to, every time I think to myself why don't I do this more often because it looks beautiful after I've done it. So that's a nice little trick to keeping your indoor plants um, healthy and happy. Uh, what else did I have down here? No, I think we've covered all of those. Oh, just if you've got in your cupboard at home maybe a pyrethrum spray, that will get rid of um, aphids for you, but not so effective on scale. But if you don't have any, uh, any oil-based sprays at home and you do have some scale or even aphid problems, you can also mix up a mixture of soapy water. So the good old-fashioned velvet soap or an organic uh, dishwashing liquid, really soapy because because you want to create that scum that again works as a suffocant and suffocates that insect pest. Um, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Depends on how, um, how tough the little scale insects are and you might need to resort to an oil-based spray. But it's nice not to use chemicals in your living environment if you can. And that's a good, just a, a simple home remedy to get rid of those ones. As a rule, they don't really suffer from any kind of fungal problems, so that's something you don't worry, need to worry about too much. It really is just those two, usually just those two insect pest problems that can, can occur. Now, styling and how to make them look good, because there's lots of nice things, lots of great pots and things you can do with your indoor plants these days. I love um, groups, grouping them together and get a little bit of a story going. So a bit, little bit of matchy-matchy looks really nice and getting a tall and maybe a blouse, a blousing one. Try and have some uniformity with your pots or whatever you're using in the house. If you're a basket person, embrace the baskets and, and have them around the home. Working with a, a colour scheme, using a neutral colour scheme is always a good idea, black and white, and replicate that through the house so that you've got a, a combination. Uh, it's pleasing to the eye if you walk through the house and there's some kind of symmetry going on. And they don't all have to be exactly the same, but it's nice that if you can mix and match them. So I don't know about you, but I like moving my plants around a little bit because I have, you know, I think, well, that might look nice here, that might look nice there. And if all my pots are kind of complementary, it means you can mix and match them really quite easily. So that's a nice little style tip too. Creating little um, families of pots is a nice way of making it look good too. Sometimes one indoor plant on its own looks a little bit lonely. And by grouping them together, one group of three can sometimes give you the effect of just creates a nice little bit of a story where you get a little bit of a mix and match situation going on there. I haven't got a little one to pop in there. But you can see how that works nicely. So it's, you need to have a, put your little indoor decorator hat on sometimes as well. Um, and it's worth, I think, investing in, in pots that you love and plants that you love because um, they can really add a lot to your home. Especially if you're selling your house, it's a great idea just to pop a couple of well-placed indoor plants around because they can really um, add a lovely ambience to your home. So we're always happy to help with, um, with what goes with what. I'm a bit of a basket fan myself. And just think about scale too when you're popping something in a basket. That basket is way bigger than that pot and it looks a little bit lost in there, do you think? Looks a bit like it's flapping around doing not too much. But if I get my old Tupperware container out of the fridge, out of the cupboard that I'm not using much anymore, and just pop that up a little bit, a little bit of height, all of a sudden that starts to work in there. So just play around a little bit with scale and pot size as well. Now I think that's enough information to get everybody started and happy off on their indoor plant journey. What about repotting? Repotting, thank you. Repotting look doesn't have to happen very much because the growth rate is not very quick as a rule. But if you are going to repot your plants, and it will happen and you definitely will need to do it from time to time, now it is perfect at the beginning of the growing season. And never have your indoor plants swimming in a pot that's too big. So something like this one, and I've got a couple of spathophyllums at home that actually need repotting um, because these ones do grow quite quickly. They're quite good. 
I would just go up to something that was only maybe five centimetres bigger all the way around. Certainly wouldn't be going up to anything too big. You don't want them swimming in a big pod because they're never, they're not, it's not going to fill it. So only ever up one or two sizes at the most and repotting only in springtime. You certainly wouldn't want to do that in the middle of winter when they're not growing. Uh, always use a good quality potty mix. Um, you can buy small sizes. Debco do one. This is called African Violet and Indoor Potting Mix. But if you have got just a regular or a terracotta tub potty mix, as long as it's a good quality one terracotta tub is the best one that we sell because it has fertilizer water storage crystals as well as saturate through it so it's a really as it's a, a better quality basic potting mix as well they would be the ones that i would be aiming for for your indoor plants um, but you might need to do something like a spathophyllum that can grow quite well you might repot them once up every couple of years um, but something like a kentia I've had a kentia in that size pot probably quite happily for three and four years because they they might only put on a couple of leaves a year so they're really not needing much extra uh, not much extra root space but you would just gauge that it's, if they're looking like they're bursting out of their pot then it's time to repot them any other questions Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask about a part of my work room. Mm -hmm. um, it's quite dark at work, and also the glass is a large window at one end, but the glass has been painted with a paint okay. so that no one can see from outside. Sure. So I just wanted to ask you that. What just can I grow? The amount of light in the room, the fact that the glass is has been painted with this opaque. Substance. Yeah. And if so, is there anything that I can put in there? That you can put in there. That's a good question. I've not actually come across anything that's been painted over. This lady works in an office space with painted over windows, so they're quite opaque. So effectively, it becomes a low, definitely. You can see out of it really clearly, like any window but nobody can, can see in. So probably the UV lights are being reduced, certainly. So it w look, it will impact on, on what you can grow. You would treat a situation like that with tinting on the windows or any kind of opa op opaque covering on the windows. It's effectively it becomes a curtain, really. So it lowers the amount of sunlight and UV coming in. Um, and in an office environment, I would imagine you'd be happy for any extra oxygen you can to get you through the afternoon. <laughs> so um, something like Spathophyllum peace lily, brilliant for office spaces because they will take low light. This is one of those um, plants that breathe out oxygen at night time as well as during the day. So I think a peace lily would be my go-to plant. We have them as small sizes through to quite big ones. Um, so there would be something that you pop on your desk quite happily or something in the corner of the room. If you had extra space, a Kentia palm would be a nice one too. They're another one that will take low light and are very forgiving of things like air conditioning and, um, and you know, just general office uh, lack of love. <laughs> now there's another question over on this side. Thank you. Any indoor plants that are... Perfume. Oh, sorry. Um, no, not so much. Um, I can't think of anything off the top. Can anyone think of one? I can't think of anything off the top of my head that's perfumed. So I would have to say, mm, I won't say categorically no, but I can't think of one that's, that is perfumed. Yeah, yeah. I've had a piece of the leaf for years mm -hmm. and I religiously feed it, but it never flowers. Okay, peace lilies will flower if the light situation is, is right for them. So that comes under that well lit but not direct sunlight umbrella. So if your peace lily or if your moth orchid or anything else that you're hoping to flower indoors is not flowering indoors, it will be because of two things. Because they're not getting enough light and they're not getting enough fertiliser. Now yours obviously is being spoiled rotten in the fertiliser department, so then it must be the light department. And look, sometimes to us it doesn't seem like it's any different. You think, well, I'm just going to move it from here to here. I can't see what the difference is, but sometimes it will just be enough. 
if that's not enough, try a different room um, or try a different fertiliser. So something like Power Feed has, has got lots of um, potassium in it, so that will is a good one for for things that fruit and flower. But if you are using, I, I'm pretty sure it's Thrive is a bit um, higher in nitrogen, so you get more leaf growth out of that one. So maybe just, just swap your fertiliser around. But it will be those two things, light and fertilising. So spathophyllums will flower happily if it's nice and bright. So around that kind of two to three metre vicinity of a window um, and also keep them fed. There was another question over here, thanks. Mm -hmm. oh. Maiden hair ferns. Now they're in my workshop 102 because they're a little bit trickier to grow. <laughs> so maiden hair ferns, now we've got to put our detective cat back on again. They are a fern, they come from wet environments. You see them in the Otways where it's constantly moist and wet. Never, ever, ever let your maiden hair get dry. They'll, they'll happily sit in a saucer of water their whole life without blinking an eye. They're one that will not tolerate being dry. So always wet for a maiden hair fern. And I can't water the top. Oh, absolutely you can. Yeah, totally. Yep. So um, we water at Van Loons. We haven't got time to be marking around with putting things in saucers and letting them draw water up. We water all our indoor plants from the top. So we don't squirt all the foliage with water, um, but we do water everything from the top. So yes, certainly you can. So maiden hairs, plenty of water. They are a little bit prone to aphids, so you might need to give them a spray with something like a pyrethrum. Always just hold it back a little bit and just let it drift over the foliage because maiden hair is quite delicate and quite, they're a bit precious, they're a little bit the, of a princess, so you don't want to blast them with any kind of a spray because you can burn them. So it's in my bathroom, mm -hmm. in the shower. Yep, yes. Yeah. Still very safe. Very safe. Don't water it with hot water. No, no. So just cold water. Yeah. Um, maybe it's too dark, so maybe try a different position in the bathroom where it's just a bit closer to the window maybe. But yeah, they are a bit tricky. I know. Any other questions? Sorry, Thank you. The You're the moth orchids. Yeah. Moth orchids are one of my most favourite indoor plants. Um, Fine, can't, can't get them to reflower. They, um, I had one for my, my birthdays in July and I treated myself to one of these one year and it was still almost made it to Melbourne Cup with the flowers hanging on the plant. Flowers last for so, so long. So when the trick with um, moth orchids is when they finish flowering, you prune them back down just kind of beyond where the flowers were. So you can see little, they look like uh, where a branch might come out. So you'd prune them down to one or two below the flowers and that will hopefully generate a new flower bud coming up from here. Now sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't, but that's what you try first. If after six months you're not getting any flower buds, or even after three months, no action from here, then you can just cut it back down at the base and new ones will still come from the base. To get them to reflower, um, and now my success with my birthday orchid, because I did get it to reflower again, was facing south um, on a window with no blinds at all. So it was nice and bright, but no direct sun coming in. So you don't want to bleach those leaves at all. So just somewhere nice and bright. If you had a window that was maybe facing east or north or even west, you would just set it back a little bit from the window unless you had a bit of a, a curtain, a lace curtain or a, 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 a blind that you could flick up a little bit. But it needs to be quite bright. So not at all dark. You don't want to bring it back, not back onto the coffee table or onto the dining room table back into the room and then just hang out around the window area and feeding is the important one so um, you could use uh, any of the liquid foods so, so again I know I'm really mentioning power feed a lot today just because I really like it um, power feed would be good but you can get also liquid um, orchid fertilizers and they would be perfect as well and if you do that once a month between September and April um, there's absolutely no reason in the world they shouldn't be continuing Continually flowering for you, popping up new flower buds, because they will reflower quite happily indoors. Now, moth orchids don't like to be overwatered. These are what are called epiphytic plants. So they grow naturally um, in the forks of, of trees. They might grow in rock crevices. Uh, they don't grow. They don't grow in pots for a start, and they don't grow in the soil. They have these aerial roots. So these ones here that flick up and over the top of the pot. 
these ones are the ones that do all the heavy lifting. They absorb uh, nutrients and moisture from the air. It's, they're amazing plants. So you don't want them to rot out and overwatering will cause root rot and then it's goodbye orchids. So you need to just let them um, dry out between waterings and, and let them grow out and over the pot because they'll absorb moisture from the air. So no more than once a week, once a fortnight is fine watering for those ones. You see them in clear pots like this one and that's to allow the roots to, to gather sunlight um, through, the, through the plastic pot there. So definitely, if you think to, me, to yourself, oh, I can't remember if I watered my, my orchid this week or not, just give it another week. It's better to go under rather than over watering with your, with your moth orchids. They are beautiful. Now, I can feel the moisture level in the air changing. Shall we just finish up with any last questions before we all make a dash for the cafe? Thank you. You don't need to use a chemical, just water. A cloth, just a soft cloth, yeah, yeah. Now just before we pack up, we are going to have one more workshop on um, indoor plants before the end of the year. Um, how to make terrarium. So if you're interested in making some homemade Christmas gifts this year, come along to my terrarium workshop. That's at the end of November. All our workshops for the um, season are up on our website and we have still got another two or three to go this year. We have someone coming to talk about the gardens of Italy and France. We've got my terrarium workshop and of course we have our girls night out that comes up at um, just before Melbourne Cup. So it's still lots going on at Van Loon so do jump onto our website for any other information and we'll do our very best to have this up on either our YouTube channel or on the website. So thanks for coming along everyone. Thank you. Thanks.